were countries in Kyushag. Kyushag is as hard to pronounce as Chiksen Mihaly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But we really love you to be with us. And uh, a lot of people in Europe in different circles, in widely different circles, have followed your work. Could you summarize for a little bit of how did you get into something as a combination of art, new media technology, a critic of the regime, uh, civil movement organizers, platform providers. How would you define yourself? Uh, yeah, so um, at the moment I would say that uh, I'm, I'm interested in um, uh, synthetic approaches towards uh, people, technology, and politics. So, um, uh, well, I borrow a lot of phenomenal analysis from a lot of people. Um, you know, primarily I look to fields like uh, science, technology, studies, history of science, um, but as well with science and sociology and others. Um, I borrow from that work and then I use that knowledge to kind of analyze a contemporary issue or situation. And then I essentially try to build a technology that fits within that space somehow and might make some things to do easier and some things to do more difficult. Um, but I came to it from, from uh, it was, I initially thought I was going to anthropology. I, I dropped out, I got a job at a design firm that was a strategic management design consulting firm. And I was able to see, um, I was able to see, uh, I think there's a truck about to back up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, People are listening to you, you know, they are <laughs> dropping in. Yeah. So I was able to see, uh, you know, the 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 way that products um, come from, say, let's say, science and engineering, um, into the market, and I became very dissatisfied with that. And so I, um, I thought, okay, well, what's the problem? And one of the things I realized was that engineers are ultimately um, they have clients, and the clients tend to be states, corporations. Um, most engineers are working. For or some organization like that. And so engineers are kind of reproducing the status quo. And I, I realized if I wanted to do something differently, I would have to be the opposite of an engineer who's supposed to be very accountable, right? You want your engineer who builds your elevator to not have been distracted, not to be reading poetry. Like, you, you want them to be, you know, just paying attention to the elevator. Um, and they're also responsible to power. And so I went to art school, actually, specifically to make a different kind of technology. I, I wasn't really that interested in art. Um, but I became more interested and, and gradually learned a lot of tools and techniques from you know, my compatriots and my teachers. And, like and how, from that background, how did you switch to become a kind of forerunner of uh, Snowden, a forerunner of Wikileaks, a forerunner of those who are trying to watch the watcher, so to speak? So, yeah, uh, it, it really was the luck of having very good students at the right time who, you know, I had come from a world where the best that I could hope to do was a symbolic transaction of some sort, right? Um, the best that I could hope to do is what artists do, which is work in the realm of symbols and make some kind of statement through a text or, or something. Um, and then I had these students who were coming from a very different world of engineering where they were building systems and they, you know, were like, oh, well, we can do this thing in a very different way. And so I was lucky to have a couple of students who were interested in what I had to offer, but then offered this other skill. And together, you know, I think we came up with this fusion of what are now kind of models of collaborative, peer-produced software platforms that allow many people to organize and to contribute in a coherent way to a, a problem. And so that's really right. But that platform was used to counter some of the surveillance techniques of the big government, right? It was, uh, well, so we have had projects which more specifically did that. I would, I would cite uh, someone who was at MIT before me named Steve Mann, who very specifically was working on um, uh, kind of counter surveillance. Um, but, uh, but what we we really, actually, I would say, were more working in an area of involuntary open government. Um, you know, so we were essentially saying, if the government is closed, um, can we do two things? Can we ask people who have information about the government or about something the government is touching to contribute it to a, a large, pure software platform? But at the same time, can we use that as a way to show you know, about 100 people in the Senate that they should no longer support these kind of spying systems. And so if we can 
you know, basically target a small number of governors to make them feel very uncomfortable about the fact that their secrets are being um, uh, are being disclosed, then I think we have a chance of actually changing some things. Well, I, I want to ask you a foundational question. We're sitting in a library, and <clears throat> these books, several hundred years ago, we started using the new information technology and printing presses, and we have these bits of uh, these uh, examples of that. It changed politics, right? And we got democracy because of the printing press. Are the new information technologies, in your opinion, and given your work in this area, are the new information technologies going to give us democracy in a richer form or something more authoritarian? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think I would, I would point to one historian, Elizabeth Eisenstein, did this beautiful history of the printing press, but it's not... It starts with the invention of the printing press, and then it ends, you know, a couple hundred years later with so many of the kind of things that we understand about contemporary society in place. But it was not a simple process, and it wasn't an uncontested process. Yeah, I know you did. Uh, it wasn't an uncontested process. It was a very gradual process of, of print entering different aspects of life and society, being, you know, tried in different ways and ending up used in different ways. So I think we're in that space right now, right? We're in this space where many of the ways that these technologies are used are, are contestable. Um, and the decisions that we're making right now might have very, very long-term implications. And so I'd say I don't think there's anything um, uh, imminent in the technology that would say it's democratic or undemocratic. Um, it's more a question of how we choose to deploy it, what we choose to find acceptable in it. Um, and, and I think those are choices that are probably going to be made differently in different places. Um, I mean, look at surveillance, the way that surveillance is treated in the U.S. versus the U.K., it's very, very different. Um, um, my question is kind of related because you touched upon this kind of collusion between states and markets. You know, when you look at that powerful, powerful partnership, um, how in the world can civil movements and civil society confront that kind of, those kind of really hard structures? You know, by using the same kind of technology that they are using to to oppress, we see an increasing yeah. level of um, unrest around the world in response to perceived and real injustice. But how in the world can we break a system like that? Well, I guess I, I would argue that it's been done before. I, you know, I had a, a mentor, Steve Shapin, who came, you know, out of the New Left, and and he talked about how in 68, 69, with Alphaville, everyone was worried about these big mainframes and somehow we'd all be turned into numbers and we haven't, right? I mean like like yeah, there 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 are issues, but um but but we haven't lost humanity in the way that people were worried about in the like, nineteen sixties. And people often just find ways of coping. So I'd say that, you know, no one imagined that the colonists would ever leave um, colonial countries. Like how could, you know, Gandhi, this laughable ninety seven pound you know, how could he have an impact? Nobody and, believed and, the Iron Curtain would fall, exactly, which exactly, is right here. Exactly. And so I would, I would say, don't, whatever you do, don't be threatened by how ubiquitous Google and state seem, because um, actually some very basic things, techniques, uh, social techniques, and I would argue technical systems could easily bring them down. Mm -hmm. um,